extremely happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Joseph Wang, as always, and our very special and distinguished guest, Robert McCauley, Senior Fellow at Boston University's Global Development Policy Center. Robert spent many years as a Senior Advisor to the Monetary and Economics Department at the Bank for International Settlements, the central bank, two central banks, uh, as well as over a decade at the New York Federal Reserve, uh, where Joseph also worked. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to, to Forward Guidance. Bob, it's so great to have you here. Jack, pleased to meet you. And Joseph, you too. Thanks so much for joining the show. Guys, for those of you who aren't familiar, Bob is probably one of the world's foremost experts on the global dollar system. Anyone who studies the system knows that Bob's work is, uh, is the best. He's published widely on this. And we're going to be in for a real treat because I know many of you are interested in how the dollar system works, how it began, and how its future might lie. So this is going to be an episode that you don't want to miss. Joseph, you, you've read uh, Bob's work immensely. How about you start off with the, the first question? Yeah. So, you know, gosh, I don't know where to start. There's Bob has dozens and dozens of publications on, on this subject. But I guess what will be helpful is maybe, Bob, if you could just sketch out what the uh, euro dollar system looks like today, and then we can talk about perhaps how it began. So just to have a little bit of background uh, of, of the system for, for the audience. The euro dollar system is a interlinked set of balance sheets that uh, straddles the globe, involves actors in most countries uh, building on the global currency, the indispensable currency, the dollar. There's uh, a credit aspect to it. There's a deposit aspect to it. It all gets measured in trillions and tens of trillions of dollars. It's mostly not in the textbooks. The textbooks tell you that the Fed creates dollars and then banks multiply those dollars so that all the dollars in the world are somehow either the direct creation of, of the central bank in the United States or a fairly mechanical multiplication of a portion of those dollars by the banking system Likewise, in the United States, turns out that the dollar sort of got away from that whole uh, setup a couple of generations ago and now spans the globe. It has both banking aspects to it. It has uh, a bond market aspect to it. It has a very large, uh, invisible, off-balance sheet uh, component to it that is uh, wildly underappreciated. It is the second language in currency terms for the rest of the world, just as people speak English after they speak their own uh, language in general. So too, for most users of various currencies around the world, the, the next currency is the dollar, the, the one that features in their international portfolio in the first rank. And that's the, the, the dollar uh, system. That, there's so many aspects of that that we're going to touch upon going forward. So many people think of the global dollar system as, as opaque because you know so much of it happens outside of the U.S., now, the Fed collects data for what happens in the U.S., but let's say what happens outside the country, it doesn't really collect so much data on. However, uh, what happens is that foreign central banks collect that data and then report it to the BIS, where you were for many years. And so at the BAS, you kind of have basically the best data and, and the best insight on this. And I, I've read some of your writings. It seems like it suggests that, uh, let's say, the U.S. banking system is about say, $25 trillion within the U.S., but there's about, I believe, about $12 trillion in dollar liabilities outside of the U.S. It seems like about a third of the, of the dollar banking system is um, outside of the U.S. that, that uh, we, we basically, part of the dollar system, but, but not onshore. So th that is pretty unique, though. It doesn't seem like many other countries are like that. How did such a big system develop to, to, um, 
to be out, out of the Fed. I mean, obviously, we're in the U.S. We don't use euros. We don't use yen. And yet the dollar is commonly used outside of the country. How did the offshore style system begin, let's say, a few decades ago? And yeah, what, what were its origins? Why did people begin to want to have to have dollars outside of this country? Well, there's a small argument, but I would uh, take the work of Catherine uh, Schenk, a sometime co-author of mine, and she starts the story in 1955, which was already earlier when she wrote than most people started the story. And here we are in London, and you're a big British bank, Midland Bank, and you have been enabled by your central bank after the war, memory of rationing is still very live. You've been enabled to do foreign exchange transactions for the first time in a long time. And so you can do forward transactions of sterling, which is still very tightly controlled, capital controls. You can do forward transactions sterling against the dollar. And what happens in 1955 is that the Bank of England is raising interest rates and the local interest rates on deposits are sort of uh, agreed to be kept at certain levels, uh, but the market rates rise for things like treasury bills and things like local government paper. And what you find is that you can pay uh, some depositor an interest rate on the US dollar that is very attractive, higher than can be paid in New York under the regulations then enforced by the Fed, so-called regulation Q, that set limits on deposit rates. You can pay above that rate and then turn that dollar through the forward exchange market into sterling and take that sterling and place it in the government, local government paper at a return that is very attractive even after you pay the dollar interest rate, which is itself very attractive uh, and pay the premium that comes through the foreign exchange transaction. And meanwhile, you're not taking any risk because while you did a spot transaction to turn the dollar into sterling, you have at the same time a forward transaction that reverses that so that you end up in effect with a synthetic dollar asset, which is this local government paper in Britain that is covered, has a forward transaction on top of it to bring it back into the dollar. So that sort of transaction arguably is the first birth after the war of the euro dollar. And the key element is that it's a dollar deposit outside the United States and the proceeds are not just sort of put into the United States back, back to the home market, but the proceeds, there's a use found for them outside the United States. And in this case, it's the synthetic dollar uh, asset and later it becomes other dollar assets, uh, a trade paper, uh, for instance, or, or uh, loans to support goods and services trade. So that's the that's the birth of the beast. <laughs> that's the birth of the beast, Bob. That the swap transactions was over my head, and I, I want to ask you about that later. But just for for myself and some audience members, so the euro dollar system. We're not talking about the U.S. dollar against the currency, the euro. The euro did not exist when the euro dollar system was born. It was, it's a dollar that is in Europe, in actually in London, back when you know London was, was in Europe. Uh, and so it's an offshore dollar. That is what a euro dollar is. And just to sort of give the, the, you know, the summary, two, at least two reasons why it happened. One was regulatory arbitrage. And a, a, another was just, you can get higher rates. The rest of the world is perhaps slightly riskier than America. So America, you know, higher risk, higher reward. Uh, what was fundamentally different about a dollar that is in London 
versus a dollar that is within the domestic banking system? Well, first, Jack, thank you very much for that uh, point of clarification. With the advent of the euro, anytime you talk about euro dollar, you're in deep uh, danger of being misunderstood. So thank you very much for uh, addressing that possible uh, confusion. And you are absolutely right that it's regulatory arbitrage is the name of the game uh, here. And in the example I gave, there's a an agreement among British bankers not to pay interest rates above a certain uh, level that's that's in operation, uh, but the open market paper uh, yield goes goes above that. That's a key part of the the story. But the main action in terms of the regulations that are being end run uh, lies in the United States, and the example was the regulation uh, Q, and that stayed around and was part of the story even as late as uh, the 1980s, but uh, longer running uh, regulations that uh, were driving activity in the dollar offshore were reserve requirements of, of the Federal Reserve. And those essentially say that you have to hold X percent of a deposit in a non-interest bearing uh, account at the Federal Reserve. And so that basically raised the cost of a deposit, the so-called only the cost of the deposit would be above what the depositor would actually receive. And that's another driver. And another important driver is FDIC in insurance. So basically these are elements of cost that get in between the depositor and the borrower of dollars in the United States. And through the simple expedient of running the deposit and the loan outside the United States, that, that wedge, those two wedges, those two costs could be, could be avoided. And, and that is the, uh, as an essential thing to understand about the euro dollar system. Uh, the rest of the world wanted to use the dollar and the rest of the world got to use it at lower cost uh, without putting the, the nickels in the tin cup of the, of the Fed and the FDIC the way that uh, domestic borrowers and depositors had to do. And so you, it sounds like an advantage because you don't have to pay the FDIC and you don't have to have this reserve requirement. But with that, you're, you don't have some protections. Uh, if, you're, if you deposit even you know, a small amount of money and the bank that's offshore goes under, you're, you're not subject to, uh, it's, not an, it's not an insured deposit. So people who deposit money in offshore banks don't have that guarantee at all. What, what's the connection between the Federal Reserve? In a domestic bank, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, Federal Home Loan Bank, very involved at the bank. You know, we think of it as a, a private market, private sector, and it is private, but there are a lot of uh, uh, agencies that have a lot of sway in, in domestically. But what sway do those agencies have on the offshore dollar system, if at all? Well, let me uh, back up a bit. It, I'm a little uncomfortable at times with the phrase, the euro dollar system, because it may suggest to folks that this is something completely different, something um, very uh, set apart. Uh, same applies to shadow banking, where some people say, oh, the euro dollar market was the original uh, shadow banking system. But most of the activity, the overwhelming majority of activity in the, the euro dollar market has always been done by banks that are big and have a home base uh, somewhere. And so in putting your money in a bank, a, a dollar in a bank in, in, in London, you weren't taking it in and putting it into some unknown uh, entity. This, this is no uh, stable coin of the era. This, this was a name that you recognized uh, well in the, the original example, Midland. Uh, speaks to that. By the 
end of the 60s, much of the activity in London was being done by U.S. banks, in fact. So you had the, the assurance that uh, this bank was going to uh, be there when your deposit matured because that bank was capitalized, because that bank was regulated. Uh, there were questions, of course, about how that regulation extended to the London operations, but the entity as a whole was... Uh, a, a, a solid institution by and large, and there was there was that trust from from the very get go in the euro dollar market. So these are integrated, uh, institutionally integrated markets from day one. Uh, there, there's there's not a sort of separate group of institutions sitting out there with a with a word Eurobank painted on the on the front door and that that's an important consideration so the you you asked about well what was the role of the the fed well the fed about the the euro dollar market uh, the fed sort of became aware of it and sent a team out to find out what was going on there in 1959 they came back and filed a report it was published by the New York Fed, and they found out that already there was uh, something like a, a going rate, something that we might call LIBOR had already come into existence. People knew what the deposit rate was for a month in general. There would be shadings up and down, depending on whether you were a really good bank or a not so good bank, but there was a, a pretty clear idea where the, where the market was. And the attitude of the people at the Fed was sort of accepting. You, you might say, well, they, they found out that the dollar had gotten away from them and they <laughs> needed to put a stop to that, but that was not their uh, approach and, and they uh, accepted it. And there certainly were questions, um, particularly as the market developed the new uh, financial technique of the floating rate syndicated loan that comes in in the late 60s, where you as a bank could basically bring in three-month money from the interbank market or from ultimate depositors and buy a five-year, a piece of a five-year loan where the interest rate would be reset every three months. And so there were maturity mismatches became part and parcel of the market already by the end of the 1960s. So there was a question about what, what would happen if there were a, a problem. And the big test of that, in fact, came in 1974 when a smallish, not, a, not too small, a, a Long Island bank, about the 20th size in the country, $5 billion bank, uh, got into trouble. It got into trouble doing foreign exchange in a world that had just changed with the uh, undoing of fixed exchange rates in 1973. And it didn't take long for some banks to get into trouble trading uh, for an exchange. And uh, this one, Franklin National, got into big time uh, trouble. And what ended up happening was that the Federal Reserve uh, came in and opened the discount window to Franklin National. Turned out Franklin National had opened a branch uh, both in the Caribbean and, and in London, and uh, it ended up uh, needing to borrow against its assets in London. It, it needed to get dollars from the discount window in New York and funnel it to, to meet outgoing deposits, to pay off maturing deposits in the London branch. So that was an important moment when the question arose, well, you know, okay, we all, we all assumed that the parent was responsible for this branch, but how does the Fed feel about that? And the Fed came down very clearly on that. What's more mobilized the other uh, major central banks, the so-called G10 central banks meeting in Basel, Switzerland, and they had a discussion of it and actually put out a, a statement that uh, you know, the resources and the means were there to provide a, a backstop 
when when needed without committing themselves to doing it under any particular circumstances, mind you. But at that important juncture, uh, fairly early in the market's life, the, the question came, what would the Fed do? And the Fed had a very clear answer to that. And the Fed's answer has been fairly consistent on, on that uh, ever since in terms of the uh, lender of last resort. And in general, uh, banks that have branches, U.S. banks that have gotten into trouble that uh, had foreign branches uh, like Continental Illinois in 1984 uh, relied heavily on the discount window and, and were able uh, to uh, pay maturing deposits in, in London uh, with help from the, from the Federal Reserve. And in general, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has not chosen to inflict losses on uninsured depositors of banks, of U.S. banks that had foreign branches. Now, my impression is that the that norm uh, has actually been uh, not observed this year with Silicon Valley Bank. My impression is it it has China. had a Caribbean branch with a lot of Hong Kong and other Asian uh, depositors, and they are they did not uh, uh, participate in the full uh, insurance that uh, the domestic depositors did. So I, I can't tell you a precedent for that. And I've asked people who should know whether they can cite a precedent for that, and I haven't been able to get an answer on that. But that, that seems to be a, uh, an important uh, uh, deviation from otherwise a, a norm that has seen the U.S. backstopping of, of deposits extended to the euro dollar market. So taking, taking it as a whole, there have certainly been depositor losses in a euro a dollar deposits, but they've been in in a fairly limited number of cases where a bank didn't have much of a central bank backup, uh, or there were other uh, circumstances that um, seemed to make it extraordinary. By and large, the depositors in the euro dollar market have benefited uh, from the backstop, uh, even though. They didn't sort of pay the dues in terms of reserve requirements or uh, the deposit insurance. That's really fascinating. So today, obviously, we know, as you suggested, Bob, that the Fed opens up FX swap lines to back a lot of the uh, dollar activity offshore. But it's, it sounds like it was happening in the, through the discount window at a much earlier stage. Well, let, let me just uh, draw a distinction there. The the, the, when the Fed does the swap lines, uh, the Fed already is, is able to and quite willing to provide dollars to foreign banks operating in the United States that have a collateral that can go to the discount window. But with the, with the swap lines, it is able to provide dollars to non-U.S. banks that don't necessarily have a collateral in New York or Los Angeles. Uh, but do have collateral with their home central bank and home currency. And so then using that collateral, they're able to draw the dollars that the Fed has swapped with their home central bank. So that is not an illustration of sort of what was made the ill-defined but, but fundamental norm in 1974, which went to parental responsibility, taking care of your own. This is the, the, the swap lines are the vehicle for the Fed uh, to take care of the dollar liquidity requirements of non-U.S. banks. So that that is a, a, 
a sizable further step and, and not not to be thought of as sort of just an extension of what went on with Franklin National in 1974. Yeah, the, the parallels are hard to avoid. Franklin National, you said the 20th largest bank. I think Silicon Valley was the 16th or 18th largest bank. And of course, it had maturity mismatches, which you referenced earlier with the, the dollar swaps, which uh, often lurking at the, the scene of the crime of, of bank failures. So if offshore banks, you said the perception sometimes is that it is uh, foreign banks who are just printing all this dollars and there's not a lot of responsibility. But actually, you say more often than not, or, or often, I should say, it is just JP Morgan, the branch of JP Morgan that happens to be in London or the branch of uh, a Citigroup that happens to be in, in France. That is this, quote, offshore dollar. In other words, it's kind of like a, one hedge fund manager is trading on one side of a swap against another hedge fund manager. And they're both in Greenwich, but it's technically reported through the Cayman Islands, but they're they're in Greenwich. Uh, so, so how how often is it these uh, that there are actually foreign banks who are uh, not only receiving deposits but actually making loans and making deposits? Because uh, that's my perception of how banking actually works: is you don't just gather deposits and then lend them out. Like you're you know you get a hundred dollars and then you give a ten dollars here, ten dollars there. You're sort of creating the deposit when you create the loan. So, is it true that offshore banks have the ability to just print money whenever they want to in the same way that domestic banks and the Federal Reserve can print money by just clicking a button. Well, you might thought, and, and a scholar writing in the mid-60s at, at Yale uh, did think that U.S. banks would have a natural advantage in the dollar business, this global dollar business. And he talked about it as, as sort of denomination rents. Like they would have an ability to make extra money from the fact that they were American banks and had access to the Fed and so on. But one of the remarkable observations is how little share of the dollar business outside the United States that U.S. banks have. International uh, dollar banking as measured by the BIS, the U.S. bank share is something like 16, 17% of that. It's, It's not even as large as the U.S. economy share of the world economy. So the U.S. banks have not uh, turned out to be the, the big uh, biggest players in dollar banking internationally. And that's, that's a remarkable feature. And until just uh, a little while ago, the the main short-term interest rate in dollars was set by a panel of banks in London. And I can't be trusted to give you the exact numbers, but maybe there were 20 panel members and, and maybe f- four of them or perhaps even three of them were, the, were U.S. banks. And so this panel was constructed as sort of the, the biggest and baddest of all the dollar banks in the world. And, and U.S. banks... Uh, were far from predominant uh, in in that uh, LIBOR uh, panel. So, um, yes, there were times like in the late 60s when the U.S. banks first sort of arrived in strength in London, and they sort of muscled uh, a big share of the business. But over time, it's turned out that uh, foreign banks have been the, the big players there. And so... The way to think about the market is that the, the modal depositor is a non-U.S. resident and the modal bank that it's depositing in is a non-U.S. bank. And the modal borrower, the most frequent borrower, is a non-U.S. borrower. And so the, the, the U.S. dollar in its global expression, in a certain sense, has gotten completely away from the United States. And of, of course, the transaction flow eventually has to go through uh, the U.S. when the, the, the system can create uh, dollars, making loans and deposits uh, simultaneously, as, as you described, Jack. But the, the, it's all ultimately constrained by the need uh, to pass the, the the flows of funds through uh, the U.S. Uh, market. So it, it's, it's 
it's not to be understood as completely uh, separate in 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 flow terms. It's it's very much hooked into the U.S. But uh, in terms of the stocks, the the who's who of the depositors and the borrowers and and the banks, it's kind of gotten away from us. That, that's really interesting. I mean, in the beginning, it seemed like, as Jack described in his example, it was kind of a, you know, at the two endpoints, the bar and the lender were U.S. based, but there is this regulatory arbitrage. You have a foreign component, but today a lot of it is, as you noted, it's foreign to foreign. Although, of course, payments settle through through um, through the U.S. banking system as ultimately. Um, in your work, you've also noted that when you look at dollar, when you look at currency. Broadly, let's say FX swaps, 90% is done against the dollar. And of course, we know from work from uh, Jita Gopinath that in international trade, about half of uh, trade is invoiced in dollars as well. So how did we go from a system that really kind of began as a regulatory arbitrage to this system that's widely used even by, by people who uh, don't directly have a U.S. connection? Well, I I think the the broad answer is, especially on the banking side, uh, autonomous market development. That then, after a, a, at at critical junctures, was sort of ratified by authorities. So my description of the lender of last resort in 1974 being extended to London is that sort of ratification. There were there were other cases. Now with the euro dollar bond market, that's that's really quite different because in 1963 in the Kennedy uh, presidency, there was a great exaggerated concern over the link between the dollar and uh, gold. And we had some really, really, really uh, lousy accounting uh, let me give you an example that the Secretary of Treasury uh, gave uh, at the time. Uh, you have a deposit at Chase Manhattan in New York. You go there, you get your money, and you go across the street to the agency of the Bank of Montreal, and you give them the money, and you tell them that you want it on deposit in, in Montreal. They take a dollar deposit in, in Montreal. And then the Bank of uh, Montreal and, and takes those takes those dollars and say lends them to uh, Solomon Brothers. So in a certain sense, the dollars have never left Wall Street. But under the really crazy accounting at the time, that would count one, one side of that transaction, the liability to the non-resident, liability to the Bank of Montreal would, would show up as a possible claim on the U.S. gold stock, while the uh, claim of the U.S. depositor on the Bank of Montreal would, would be left out. So very one-sided accounting turned round-trip transactions like that into threats to the U.S. gold stock. And, and this went on uh, to the point where a Treasury secretary extraordinary man named uh, Dylan. Uh, he had been the f- ambassador of France under Eisenhower. He had come from the family of Dylan's associated with Dylan Reed. His, his father had gotten his name attached to the, to the Reed uh, Bank in the 20s. They had underwritten foreign bonds, not always with good results in the 1920s, a lot of defaults. In fact, but his, uh, the, the, the son, uh, Dylan, uh, was an obvious candidate for Ambassador France because he raised campaign money for Eisenhower. And moreover, his family owned a Grand Cru Class A uh, winery in Bordeaux. So he was, he was natural. His French wasn't all that good, but he, he learned on the, on the job. And he went from uh, the job as ambassador to France to being a high official in the State Department. And then Jack Kennedy, who was sort of petrified by the gold dollar link because uh, in the course of the campaign, the price of gold had shot up on the theory that Kennedy was going to be some sort of wild and profligate uh, president as compared to Eisenhower. So Kennedy didn't understand much, but he understood that he was afraid of the price of dollar uh, and gold. 
And so he hired this uh, Republican uh, banker to take care of this for him. And that was Treasury Secretary Dillon. And so that answers the question of how it was that some American uh, financial leader, Treasury Secretary, would decide to do what he did in 1963, which was basically to put a tax on the interest paid by foreign bonds sold in the United States, a, basically a prohibitive tax so that the market went somewhere else. So he, here's a man who came from Dylan Reed, a bank that had deep roots in the foreign bond business. And he suggested to uh, Kennedy in a private conversation that they do this. What a, what a, what a patriotic guy. Now, the, the reasoning behind it with this bad accounting was crazy, and he knew that. But nevertheless, he was willing to sacrifice uh, his own family business to some extent uh, in order to deal with what he took to be a serious balance of payments problem in the United States. And so the beginning of the euro dollar bond market in a certain sense is very different from that market led process, the Midland Bank story that uh, gets you going in the uh, euro dollar deposit business. Uh, there had been just one issue organized by Warburg in uh, London for the uh, Italian uh, Autostrada. Uh, of course, it was really for the holding company uh, of Italy, which meant that it couldn't come out with any of six or eight different names. And they figured that the people buying the bonds might have been to Italy and driven on the brand new uh, auto stratas. And so that's the one they went with. Uh, that had come out even before the announcement of this so-called interest equalization tax in 1963. But basically after that, the whole market, except for Canadian issuers who were exempted and some developing countries that were exempted, basically the rest of the market, if you were uh, the city of Oslo or, or you were the telephone company of Denmark, whatever, you had to sell your dollar bonds now in London and not in New York, which wasn't such a big deal anyway, because it turned out even the ones that were being sold in the U.S. Uh, had mostly European buyers or mostly non-U.S. buyers anyway. So already the U.S. was something of an entrepot for dollar bonds for the rest of the world. And so moving it somewhere else wasn't all that uh, difficult. And in fact, the arrangements for underwriting bonds in the U.S. at that time were not all that competitive. It was kind of a cozy oligopoly of, of underwriters. And uh, so ultimately, things proved more competitive in bond underwriting in London than they had been uh, in New York. And this was something already noticed by that team from the New York Fed in 1959 when they moved, uh, they visited uh, Europe to see what the dollar was doing there. They came back saying, well, you know, this isn't really good for New York, but it's really good for the dollar. And uh, that, that's an important distinction. And I think it's part of the euro dollar story that New York and U.S. regulations were not allowed to make it expensive for the rest of the world to use the dollar. The rest of the world kind of glommed on to the dollar themselves and were prepared to underwrite dollar securities and, and, and do banking in dollars and compete among themselves very keenly uh, to do that business. And as a result, made the dollar the attractive currency that it is today. That it, it, The dollar wasn't sort of hemmed in. It wasn't root bound by practices in New York or regulations in New York. And it, it was able to become a world currency because the U.S. was no longer sponsoring it, or at least no longer had a monopoly in, in sponsoring the dollar. And, and that has made for the dollar as a global currency over, over time. And that, that's part of the story for why the uh, we have both a dollar that is so much outside the United States and a, and a dollar that, as academics are wont to call it these days, dominates. I, I'm glad you brought up euro dollar bonds, offshore dollar bonds, which 
bonds and securities different than banking? And I, I know from from reading your work uh, that actually offshore banking and uh, just generally banking in general peaked arguably either in, in 2008 or as early as 1990s. And that's security markets and you know, an explosion in debt creation of, sec- of securities, you know, money printing by governments and, and corporations, that has really led the way. Whereas, as I say, banking has kind of uh, stagnated, particularly offshore banking since the 1990s. So I, I, is that fair to say? Yes. I mean, this is not unique to the euro dollar business, of course. If you go back far enough in the U.S., U.S. companies relied more on bank loans than on uh, on, on bonds or, or commercial uh, paper. Uh, back when the Penn Central default happened in 1970, a fairly modest increase of the bank lending by the biggest banks in the U.S. could offset a 20% decline in the outstanding commercial paper. But... But yes, it, it, it actually happened outside the United States after it happened in the U.S. that the bonds have outgrown the uh, banking business. It was, so an aggregate that we put together at the Bank for International Settlements, it's there under the global liquidity indicators. That uh, aggregate is about $13 trillion of non-U.S. non-bank uh, liabilities, debts, uh, that uh, are essentially that's dollars owed by non-U.S. residents. Uh, that's now 13 trillion, and, and that's made up of about seven trillion dollars in bonds and six trillion dollars in uh, bank loans. And that 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 has flipped. That flipped relatively recently. Um, the um, Whereas that happened, you know, a generation ago in in U.S. corporate uh, finance. So yes, but the the contrast I was drawing earlier is between the euro dollar bond market as a conscious creation by people who understood how markets work to, in effect, export a piece of the U.S. capital market to the rest of the world for. Unfortunately, uh, kind of bad reasons, uh, but that was a that was a conscious choice. Whereas the development of the of the deposit and lending market was much more autonomous and, and uh, only to be ratified later. Got it. So if you're an Argentinian company or a Ghanaian company, you can ar- you know, borrow in Argentine pesos, but you're going to be paying forty percent, sixty percent. Oh. You can borrow in dollars at, and you'll only pay 16%. And so it seems much better. But the, the reality is that ma- mathematically, if one cur- currency A yields more than currency B, that's because the forward price of currency A is going to be lower than currency B. And what about the risk of the dollar squeeze? In other words, why does the rest of the world act as if it is short dollars, even though, uh, as, as you've written, the is it correct to say that the rest of the world is actually net long dollars? So that's a, a cute paradox. Uh, if you start off with the U.S. external accounts, the U.S. is basically borrowed from the rest of the world in dollars and has used those dollars to, to buy dollar bonds, yes, but also to buy non-dollar bonds and also to buy equity and, and uh, other assets in, in foreign currency. So the U.S. is very clearly in its external accounts, short the dollar and long the rest of the world's currencies, which implies if you turn the point of view around that the rest of the world is very long the dollar to the extent of something close to 100% of US GDP. And so what that suggests is that when the dollar goes up, the rest of the world ought to be feeling very ducky. They, They should be pleased as punch. Uh, the uh, positive wealth effect is, is, is there very clearly in the U.S. external accounts. But uh, as you suggested, the rest of the world sort of acts, kind of goes into a funk when the dollar is strong. And, and how can that be so? Well, 
you know, there's a there's a fallacy of composition here. What's true of the whole is not true of the parts, and the parts don't all count for the same in behavioral terms. What do I mean? Well, who owes the dollars? There are, there are plenty of non-U.S. Uh, residents, uh, $13 trillion worth right now. Uh, and those people, uh, those companies, those uh, governments have been a bit on the hurting side as the dollar has been strong recently. In fact, I was looking at the data and the dollar uh, debts of the rest of the world, non-banks in the rest of the world are, are going down right now after years of uh, robust uh, growth. So the, the holders of those debts are kind of hurting right now. Well, some of them are fine because they have dollar revenues and the, those dollar debts are really just kind of hedge finance. They're hedging the cash flows. It, it all works out for them. But a lot of them aren't. Uh, and even those that are hedged, their banks, to the extent that they're, they're bank loans, they're, they're banks, think, think of a European bank. It, it has its capital in euros. And, and then it's got a big chunk of its, its assets in dollars. So when the dollar goes up, what happens? Its capital asset ratio deteriorates, actually. But its loans are in dollars, so it's the value of its assets go up, right? Let's say it's balanced in terms of its assets and liabilities, its borrowings and, and lending in dollars. Let's say that's balanced. But its equity is all in, in euros. So what that is, I mean, you, you, can, you can hedge your assets and liabilities or you can hedge your capital asset ratio, but you can't hedge both. And so typically what, what's unhedged is the capital asset ratio. So when the, when the dollar rises, suddenly these banks are poor in the sense that their, their own equity is smaller in relation to, the, to their assets. And so that tends to make those banks want to... Uh, contract their lending, particularly in, in dollars. And at the same time, to the extent they've got borrowers that don't really have dollar cash flows to the extent they have dollar borrowings, their credit worthiness is deteriorating, suggesting losses down the road on the credit side for the banks that have lent to them. So another reason for the bank to constrain its lending in, in dollars. So there's a sense, and this has been elaborated by my former colleagues at the, at the BIS over uh, some years now, the, the, the effect is that the dollar rising is like a, a tightening of global financial conditions because the, the borrowers and, and, and their lenders are affected negatively, even if their governments have large dollar reserves, even if their pension funds have large dollar holdings, even if insurance companies in the same countries have large dollar holdings. And, and those government and pension fund and insurance company holdings might add up to, to being more than the dollar debts of, of the dollar borrowers. But the insurance companies, pension funds, governments, they don't have to react when the dollar rises. But these uh, dollar uh, borrowers are in a different position. So there is a kind of tightening of global financial uh, uh, financial conditions when when the dollar rises, and that's that's on top of uh, the other effect, which is of course to the extent that I have a floating rate loan in dollars and I'm outside the United States, when the Fed raises the interest rates by 500 basis points in a year, my my cash flow suddenly look very different. Uh, so that's. Uh, there's the direct effect of the dollar borrowing, and then there are these these other sort of balance sheet effects that it, both the borrower uh, and the uh, lenders are f less well capitalized, perhaps. Uh, and 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 what we what we saw since the uh, great financial crisis was a a huge burgeoning of, of dollar borrowing is particularly in the bond market. Uh, so that happened on both the extensive margin, the Ghana uh, could sell a dollar bond for the f first time in memory, 
and, but also it happened in the intensive barge in Petrobras, a huge borrower of dollars, uh, in order to dig those wells out in the Atlantic, went to the markets repeatedly uh, for huge amounts, even a hundred year bond, uh, in order to, to fund holes in, in the Atlantic. Uh, and so there's, there's all this dollar exposure out there. And, and typically when the dollar is strong, the price of oil doesn't do so well. And so even if in terms of the denomination of trade, even if the dollar is the way that the oil is paid for, so in a certain sense, they have dollar cash flows. But if, if the dollar strength means that the oil price tends to weaken, then Petrobras isn't completely uh, hedged when it's borrowing in dollars in order to develop its, its oil sales. In layman's terms, the rest of the world, non-U.S., is net long dollars, but the governments are the ones that are primarily long dollars, and corporate borrowers and sometimes banks are short the dollar. Yes. And if the dollar yeah, governments and pension funds and insurers, so the sort of inst- big institutional investors are long dollar. But but yes, but when the dollar goes up, it doesn't make a difference to them. It doesn't impact their financial activity. They don't stimulate the economy or you know, give out more fiscal support or do, do anything different. But when but the people who are short the dollars, the uh, corporations, their borrowing costs go up. So compositionally, the folks who are most likely to act those are the ones who are short dollars. I also thought of just the floating fixed. The government's, you know, most treasuries, not all, but most of it is fixed rates. So if the governments are long fixed rate treasuries and then the corporations are short floating rate loans, rising rates hurts both of them. But maybe they're hedged. I don't know. But that also speaks to the broader idea that the Fed is kind of like the world's global central bank because uh, its actions it spilled over to other countries to a large extent through this offshore dollar, uh, dollar banking and offshore dollar capital markets. When the Fed raises rates, people who borrowed in dollars, you know, they have to pay higher interest rates. And of course, when they raise rates, the dollar strengthens. And so that also has a, a balance sheet impact on, on many of the borrowers. I, I just just to add to that, Joseph, there's there's also another channel there. When, when the Fed raises rates, a lot of central banks in the world will follow, not step by step, but not, not like Hong Kong, but broadly the rest of the world uh, follows suit. So we have two big, big time exceptions uh, currently, of course, in Japan and China, uh, Japan having done nothing and China actually going the other way. And we had extraordinarily in this cycle, the Mexicos and Brazils actually getting ahead of the Fed, not just waiting sort of to get the message from Washington, but but moving uh, sooner, which has made the emerging market currencies unusually uh, robust against the dollar in, in this particular cycle. So that, that part of the dynamic of dollar strengthening being um, a global tightening, that hasn't been working so much because the emerging market central banks in many cases obviously not in all cases but in in important cases the emerging market central banks were were out ahead of the fed which wasn't all that hard of course but they were they were out of out ahead and the result is that the, their currencies have performed better and so those balance sheet dynamics that usually are, are sort of headwind for the corporate sector in those uh, countries have have operated with less force this go round. As you noted, a lot of people have to react to, to what happens in the Fed, and it seems like some countries, you know, don't really like to do that. So that you have more and more, I guess, noise in the press about people wanting to move away from the dollar, come up with their own currency, and and of course, recently uh, with with what happened during the war in Ukraine, there there also seems to be some countries who are more concerned about some some country risk and. And relying on dollars after all. Uh, as you noted earlier, Bob, ultimately dollar transactions have to go through the U.S. banking system and the U.S. authorities have control over that so they could uh, use all sorts of financial sanctions against uh, people who are not compliant with their laws. What do you think about the, the prospect of uh, de-dollarization? Is this something that is just, you know, uh, a lot of hot air or, or is this something that that could that, that, that's actually real and taking place. 
No, this morning, the European Central Bank published its the international role of the euro uh, 2023, and they go through uh, some of the limited evidence for a de-dollarization that uh, has been observed over the past year or two. And there's more uh, smoke than fire here, Joseph. Um, and the, the case I like to give in point is that of Russia. So uh, Russia got onto the uh, list in 2014 when it annexed uh, Crimea. And, and again, there were an important round of sanctions from the US and, and the Europeans in 2018. And the Russians reacted uh, to those as you would uh, imagine uh, trying to de-dollarize their foreign exchange reserves, trying to move the dollars that they held outside of the United States, selling their treasuries and, and so on. But as best I can tell, uh, the Central Bank of Russia went into the, the war in Ukraine, the, the, the date I, I have to, to draw the inference is only updated through uh, 2020. So as of the end of 2020, it looks like the Russians had exposure to the dollar in their reserves of 38%, which was down very marginally from where it was in 2013. So they moved dollars out of the U.S. They had done, uh, they had changed their dollars into kind of virtual dollars by using the foreign exchange swap market. They probably had yen that were uh, hedged forward back into dollars. Uh, why would they hold so many dollars? Well, they also had to steal 20% of the banking system that was in dollars, a lot of mortgages, a lot of corporate credit still. Their foreign exchange market was still dominated by dollar uh, transactions. So the, the dollar, this is a country that had been under sanctions since 2014 and is not moving in a friendly direction vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis the United States. Uh, they knew better than, than we, no doubt. So how do, you, how do you make sense of that? It wasn't that they were doing nothing, but they did very limited de-dollarization because the, the dollar is so deeply ingrained in, in their financial markets, the foreign exchange market, in their banking system. And so it, it's just very, very difficult to shake the dollar, even if you're in the midst of sanctions and have probably good reason to anticipate more and worse sanctions. So this is uh, not an easy uh, business, and we can talk about paying for oil in uh, UAE dirham or or uh, RMB. Uh, we can talk about these things, but the the truth of the matter is that the the dollar is is really dug in. We can put some charts uh, up from a, a section I think of from your section with with, with Barry Eichengreen about how. Yes, Russia diversified the location of its foreign exchange reserve, XBEX reserves, uh, away from the U.S., but the actual amount of U.S. dollars, it did, did decline, but it did not decline by that much when you take into account the synthetic uh, uh, foreign exchange. So why is this the case, Bob? Why, what, what, what negative consequences would Russia have suffered if it totally de-dollarized? What are they trying to avoid when Politically, the sort of realpolitik indicates, yeah, they, they really shouldn't, you know, they're not friendly with the United States, but they still are dependent upon the dollar system. Why? Well, your, your banking system has a, a, a fifth of its footings in, in dollars. So that means that you need to think about the possibility of being a lender of last resort to your banks in the dollar. Right there, you're not going to get a swap line from the from the Fed, uh, yeah. and so uh, and there, there's even been reports that uh, before before the war that uh, the central bank of Russia had accumulated in cash. I, I think the number that was uh, thrown around was twelve billion dollars worth of euro and dollar cash, because they were worried about people going to the bank and and asking for. Uh, dollars in, in cash. And in a normal country, uh, 
if you get a sudden demand for dollar cash from your banking system, you you ring up uh, HSBC and they arrange uh, for a plane to to arrive with bales of fifties and hundred dollar bills in the hold and to be unloaded and and there there you've got the the cash to to meet the run, but you're not in a position to make that phone call if you're in uh, Russia in in recent years. So they actually reportedly actually had, had accumulated cash in their vault, both in, in euros and, and, and dollars. So when the private sector in the foreign exchange market, in the banking market, is deeply implicated with the dollar, you can exhort them, they did, you can give, provide incentives. I think I read recently they, they changed the reserve requirements in Russia to, to raise the reserve requirements on, on dollars. Uh, that's, um, that's a very market-friendly approach to trying to de-dollarize, actually, as opposed to just passing a law that says you, 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 you've just converted all the dollars in, into uh, rubles. But... Uh, However, they have approached this, and they've approached it for 10 years. They, 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 they didn't get to the bottom of it in terms of rooting the dollar out of their own financial system. And that's, that's, that's kind of an extraordinary statement that a motivated, uh, technically quite adept uh, group of uh, financial uh, leaders were, were unable to make all that much progress in the de-dollarization until it became really, really, really necessary. And now, now of course, under, under duress, it, it is, but, it, but, it, but it's, still, it's still happening. Right. And so it I goes without saying that, Bob, for your entire career, uh, you know, people have been predicting the imminent demise of the dollar system, and they've been wrong. But that doesn't necessarily mean that predictions that you know, the dollar system as we know it may evolve into some sort of new monetary order gradually and slowly. If there is an evolution and you know, in 10, 20, 30 years, the dollar is used less, maybe it's still dominant, but it's used less. I mean, how, what would have to happen for a sort of gradual dollarization to, to occur? Let, let me just provide a baseline before I take on that uh, question. So uh, Barry Eichengreen, co-authors at the IMF, have published this uh, paper that's gotten uh, uh, deserved uh, recognition that talks about the stealth or the slow uh, decline of, of the dollar. And what mostly they have is central banks selling the dollar and buying Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, uh, Korean won, Sing dollars, um, Norwegian kroner, uh, Swedish kroner, that sort of thing. And what that tells me is that you've got more central banks that are approaching their reserve management like it's a portfolio business. And if you read the annual reports of the Swiss National Bank, it's very clear that as their reserves grew, they took on a more and more of a, the perspective of an endowment runner. And so they were much less worried about suddenly needing all the money uh, to intervene in the market. So they, they didn't need dollars or euros to the extent that they might have thought they did in the past. And they could they could expand the horizon of possible currencies. And they and they did. They, they spread out their their money and they bought equities and they, they bought into smaller currencies. They opened an office in Singapore. This is what happens when, when you're rich. Uh, and if you look at the Norwegian pension fund, it's, it's managed on a global basis too. And no, no one should be surprised that if you've got a trillion dollar endowment, that you're not 60% in the, in the US dollar uh, just because the dollar is the biggest currency in the foreign exchange market. Uh, so I see that gradual erosion to be a symptom largely of large investment tranches, large 
um, kind of portfolio management problems that are being addressed in the way that sort of private portfolio managers uh, do it. If you look at, to, to me, a, a very a key metric is what currency is used, and you mentioned it uh, before, uh, Joseph, I believe, um, what, what currency is used in the foreign exchange market, in particular in the forward market, in the swaps and, and forwards, and that's consistently around 90%. That hasn't, that hasn't budged. There's no gradual erosion of the dollar's uh, use uh, in, in that dimension. So let, let's be clear what that means. It means the dollar is on the one side of almost every forward foreign exchange transaction. It, it means that if, if you want to go from one currency to another currency, and even if the two currencies are sitting in countries right next to the euro area, the more liquid market for you to go through is the dollar market. So if you want to swap from a Swedish kroner into Polish zloty, the dollar uh, forwards against those currencies have more volume than the euro forwards against those currencies. And presumably they're the cheaper way to make that transaction happen. So it's, it's a fair hypothetical question you're asking. What has to happen uh, for this, um, for for there to be a serious change, and you posed it, uh, Jack, in terms of a, a a gradual change. But these things don't always happen uh, gradually, and it's 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 maybe also interesting to think what what could lead to a to a a, a more sudden uh, evolution and. And clearly, sanctions put uh, authorities all around the world on notice that they get on the wrong side of whomever, and 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 suddenly the rules, it would seem, can can change on them. But it's important to recognize who who that on the other side of the the wrong side of is in this instance. It's not it's not just the U.S. It's not just the euro area. It's it's essentially all the currencies that are in the SDR uh, basket, other than the RMB, those are the countries that have joined the, the sanctions. And, and the other uh, currencies that you might go into, the Swedish, Norwegian, the Korean, or Singapore, they're, they're all in the, in the, in the same uh, position. So it's not that there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, but there are very limited choices where to run and where to hide. And if you're China, <laughs> you can't run and hide in your own currency. So, uh, it, it's it's difficult, but I suppose you could make the case that if if you get a, a set of uh, shocks, a set, a set of political surprises that are strong enough, and if the group of uh, sanction imposing uh, jurisdictions uh, shrinks, then and you're really back to a sort of unilateralism on the part of the U.S. That could provoke, because uh, there are huge front-end costs, there's a huge fixed cost to, to setting up real alternatives to the dollar. But if, if you get enough uh, potential members of that coalition and you make the threat seem uh, so strong, then you can presumably bring that coalition uh, in, into existence. And, and I've always thought the RMB internationalization was partly the engineers in Beijing. They looked at the world in 2008. They said, wow, there's a single point of failure here. It's called the dollar. And the Fed came to the rescue with the swaps, uh, unprecedented, huge amounts, um, actually 600 billion as opposed to the 20 billion of uh, dollar liabilities of non-U.S. banks. They, they didn't have to go very far to stabilize things when you think of the whole size of the, of the issue uh, there. But in any case, uh, from the Chinese perspective, setting up a, a sort of alternative uh, fallback, I mean, what, what bank operates without, a, without backup computing, without some mainframes in a mountain somewhere? Uh, so the international system, you could say, is 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 operating uh, with a big single point of failure, and it it proved extraordinarily resilient thanks to the Fed's uh, 
willingness to serve as the international lender of last resort, but you know, from an objective, from a sort of engineering rather than an economic perspective, you could say uh, it's it's a single point of failure. And so that is is part of the reason to me behind the RMB internationalization, and maybe even thinking of it as a sort of standby product is is the is the right way. But but what is it in political terms that that pushes you from a standby mode? to an active mode, I, I think it it's it's takes a huge displacement, Jack. I think it's just it's just a huge movement that affects lots of of countries and where the source of the the, the, the provocation is unilateral or very very close to it. So I don't want to say that the it's impossible, but it uh, would take it would take a lot and it would take a, a very concentrated um, displacement yeah so yeah the us is the us dollar is at the nexus of so many foreign exchange uh, swap transactions as you wrote and it's it's uh, asymmetrically bipolar and so many FX swaps go through the dollar, uh, a very, very, very large percentage. RMB, of course, a, a Chinese currency, same as yuan, renminbi. And then uh, SDR is the International Monetary Fund's special drawing rights. And it's interesting you mentioned the swap lines because in uh, your new book, Man- Manix, Manias, Panics, and Crashes, the eighth edition of uh, Kindleberger's classic, you write about how the Fed's swap lines in 2008, which you just referenced, actually exceeded the International Monetary Fund's obligations to supply credit to the rest of the world. So it, it really is a single point of failure that the Federal Reserve... Joseph, I want to bring you on this, uh, uh, you know, any, any topic, but I also want to introduce... Uh, just the notion of U.S. Treasuries and how foreign central bank reserve managers have been diversifying away from U.S. Treasuries, as Bob just cited, into other currencies. Is the reason because of that due to the, perhaps the word, it's too dramatic, glut of Treasuries, the U.S. produces a lot of debt? Joseph, you have been a, a very uh, noted observer of the, the huge amount of dollar debt that has been issued. And you, you tie that to who's going to buy these U.S. treasuries domestically. Are the banks going to buy them? No, the Fed's not buying them anymore. What do we have as a result? Interest rates uh, exploded higher. You know, the 10-year went above 4% last year. And you know, that was a very good call by you. Moving that to the international picture, what do you see? If the U.S. continues to produce a ton of debt, will there be a time where uh, reserve managers will continue to, they, they still want to own the dollar. It's just they, they can't own uh, as much debt as the U.S. is producing. And Joseph, your thoughts on that, of course, Bob. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So I think if you look at the data, it looks like foreign ho- foreign official holders of treasuries ha- have basically plateaued. So they haven't really been increasing the overall exposure of the treasuries. I think, as Bob noted, they, they seem to be di- diversifying a bit. As Bob noted, the Swiss National Bank, for example, owns a lot of uh, U.S. equities uh, like, like Apple. Um, but the data suggests that the foreign official sector isn't buying uh, treasuries anymore like like they used to. They've just kind of held the line, um, which means there are a smaller percentage of overall treasury holders as, as the market continues to grow and they keep their, their current level. Uh, I actually have a question for Bob. Since we've been talking about the growth of, uh, let's see, how the dollar system, the, the use of dollars is resilient, but let's look at it from the U.S.'s perspective. So some people think of the U.S., dollars global dominance as an exorbitant privilege, right? Uh, we uh, issue lots of treasuries and because people uh, like dollars, they hold them. And sometimes perhaps it's also a burden when there's something happening in the world. We have the Fed uh, sipping in as a lender of last resort, opening up the FX swap lines uh, to foreign banks that, that are that are not, uh, perhaps don't even have a nexus to the U.S. So when we think about from the U.S.'s perspective, how should we think about this reserve currency status? Is it really just his huge benefit that some people describe, or is it more balanced? There's, a, you know, it, it's not that not clear benefits, and there are some costs as well. I'm on the um, balanced uh, side, uh, Joseph. It's I, I think of just going through the supposed advantages. Uh, to the U.S. and I think they're systematically overstated 
by people. I mean, there's a tendency in the rest of the world to believe that the U.S. has a great hustle uh, going. And, and certainly when it comes to dollar cash abroad, if the estimates of 1.1 trillion held outside the United States are correct, that's a pretty sweet deal. That's, uh, let's say, at 5%. If, if all that came back in the Fed right now, and the Fed uh, had to, to borrow that uh, s- same money through one or more of its uh, ways of borrowing through the repo facility or, or uh, interest on overnight. Any, anyway, well, however, uh, that would cost it like 5%. So we're talking about $55 billion a year is sort of the running value of that uh, cash sitting outside the United States. Well, that's a pretty nice amount of money. That was sort of what the U.S. military aid to Ukraine cost in the first year of, of the war. So that's it's not nothing. But in the grand total of the U.S. budget, U.S. economy, it's not really, really big time uh, money either. It, it's it's big money for you and me, but it's but for the nation, it's it's not it's not really a huge amount of money. That's 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 sort of the unambiguous plus. But we have to recognize the the ECB has some of some of that too. So we 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 share that kind of uh, gift from the rest of the world. And the, the ECB may have five hundred or six hundred uh, billion of cash outside the euro uh, area. So that we don't get all of, all of that. Uh, I think it's worth. Uh, noting. Um, the the next thing people say is, well, you get to borrow in your own currency. Well, that, that is that is nice, but it, it's by no means unique to us. Australia, as, as best the Australians can tell, borrows not only to uh, plug its deficits, which have recently disappeared, but to finance its deficits, rather, but also to acquire foreign currency assets claims on the, on the rest of the world. So the Australians are, they don't do that as big time in relation to their economy as we do, but they're in the same game that we're, we're playing and, and no one would mistake the Australian dollar for the, for the U S dollars international role. So that's, that's uh, nice, but not, not a particular characteristic of the dollars uh, role. Yes. Yeah, so sorry, Bob, if I could just say, so, uh, and this is kind of a elementary basic understanding of macroeconomics, but the Australia uh, printing a lot of uh, debt, it is not automatically demanded by the Central Bank of Brazil, the C- Central Bank of, of China, People's Bank of China, uh, foreign reserve managers. So eventually, uh, a country that does not have a reserve currency, if it issues a, a, uh, if it has if it runs a sufficiently large current account deficit or aka prints a sufficiently large amount of debt maybe that currency would suffer the currency would depreciate inflation would rise interest rates would have to rise domestically is it fair to say that the US does not have faces those challenges perhaps and that is why some have called it an exorbitant privilege well as joseph just said the the foreign central banks haven't been doing this uh, haven't been doing the treasury any net uh, service uh, in 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 recent years, and and we've had to sell that paper to somebody else. Uh, so that as a symptom of the dollar's global role is is not financing our treasury right now, um, and and somehow we're getting getting by without it. So the the other the other point people make is the treasury gets to borrow cheap. And start off with the idea that only 60% of reserves are in the dollar. So whatever benefit we're talking about must be spread out over the euro area and the other uh, reserve issuing uh, currencies. Then uh, you notice when uh, there are purchases of, of U.S. treasuries that the interest rates do decline on them. Uh, for instance, one study back uh, of the 2003 through 2004, uh, giant intervention by the uh, Japanese authorities, uh, a study by Bernanke and, and co-authors uh, concluded that maybe for every billion dollars that, that uh, the Japanese bought in the foreign exchange market, U.S. Uh, 10-year bond yields went down a basis point. Well, 
it sort of doesn't add up since the Japanese did $235 billion worth of <laughs> intervention is a little implausible. They put the thumb on the scale for 200 basis points. But anyway, putting that aside, when uh, some co-authors, uh, including Kazuo Ueda uh, and, and I looked into this a few years ago, we found that those same purchases of, of dollars by the Japanese authorities also pushed down interest rates in Canada and the UK and Germany and even Japan. So there's a global bond market out there and they're not perfect substitutes, but they're enough substitutes so that any uh, thumb on the scale in the US treasury market gets spread out to uh, the rest of the world's major bond markets. And moreover, it gets spread out across the US bond market uh, too and including the, uh, say, $13 trillion worth of dollar bonds uh, outstanding by non-U.S. residents. So the idea that somehow the U.S. Treasury is the sole recipient of any lower interest rates that comes from the dollar's global role is a little implausible when you think of, A, how the, the, the U.S. only has 60% of uh, reserves, and, and B, how the, the diffusion of lower rates goes across countries and, and within the U.S. and within the U.S. dollar market, there's a substantial foreign uh, chunk. So um, that, uh, that piece of the exorbitant uh, privilege, I don't think, holds up to a careful uh, analysis. Uh, there's a, I've already referred to this idea that somehow American financial institutions uh, get a huge amount of rent from the dollar's role. The U.S. banks don't have all that big a share of the dollar global business. The one place the U.S. Uh, banks do well is in underwriting uh, dollars. They got a sizable share underwriting international bonds in dollars, but they also have a sizable share in underwriting bonds in euros. Uh, so it's it's not clear that the currency angle there is all that important. They, they're, they're just pretty good as underwriters, it, it, uh, it, it turns out. And then there's the idea that the US, despite having an external net liabilities uh, approaching 100% of GDP, doesn't pay any net investment, uh, doesn't make any net investment payments. And that is a, a giant mess uh, to be sure, because we, we know that because when, when Apple moved some intellectual property into Ireland, suddenly the GDP exploded there by 15% or something. So that's that's bogus. And, and that same bogosity gets reflected in the earnings of that foreign affiliate of, of Apple that show up in our direct investment returns. And so that, that is an incredibly muddied uh, pond at this at this point, but one point I do want to make on on this one is that the U.S. market for mergers and acquisitions is the most open one in the world. And foreign companies come here and they buy, they spend big bucks, they have an adverse selection of companies. They buy Chrysler, they don't buy Ford. Uh, they 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 uh, spend money at, at PEs that are uh, high relative to the going rate. They time their purchases late in the cycle so that they're paying higher prices and they divest uh, to a very remarkable extent after holding these uh, properties for, for some years, uh, not just real estate, but manufacturing services in Hollywood. And, and if you look back at the record, it's, it's very bad. You can say, well, how can the foreign companies keep making the same mistake over and over? But it's a different set of foreign companies. It was the British companies one time, and then it was the German companies, and, and now it's the companies of, from India and China. It's their turn to come here and buy and lose. And uh, that's, that's part of the way the U.S. earns its way in the world is by being this giant market that you can enter through merger and acquisition much easier than anywhere else, and you can lose your shirt here, and they regularly do. So... Uh, those are various dimensions, various notions of, of uh, the uh, exorbitant uh, privilege. And I don't think much of any of them, to tell you the truth. Got it. Th thank you. Uh, we, we've run long, but I've, I've got to ask you about swaps. So we talked about the banking system, 
securities market bonds, and then swaps. I feel like the former two, even applying to offshore and euro dollar, are, are well understood, if not by, by, by mainstream, then you know, by, by yourself and, and, and others. But the F, this foreign exchange swaps, it's uh, definitely way over my head. But you came out with a piece uh, <laughs> alongside Patrick McGuire and, and Claudio Borio, who Joseph and I will be speaking to uh, uh, Dr. Borio later in this summer. And it caused quite a stir when it came out in December of, of last year. It's called Dollar Debt in FX Swaps and Forwards, Huge Missing and Growing. And you found that non-banks outside the United States owe as much as $25 trillion in such missing debt. And that uh, uh, non, non-US banks owe upwards of $35 trillion and that this could cause dollar funding squeezes. Could you explain in you know, as simple uh, as you can what the nature of the of, of this problem is and the mechanics of it. Okay. Um, in a, a foreign exchange uh, swap, I give you uh, my currency and you give me your currency. And then we agree in a week, two weeks, a month, three months to turn that around. And we agree on the price. And one way of looking at that price is that it's a kind of an interest rate. It's really a compound of the two of the two uh, interest rates. And so one way of looking at that market is that one side, in most of the swaps, the dollar is involved. One side is borrowing dollars and the other is lending dollars. And um, you can think of it as not all that different from a repo market, except the collateral is different. In a repo transaction, I have a treasury bill and, and I get cash against that. And whereas in, in this case, I have uh, some Japanese yen and I get dollar cash uh, against that. But the accounting is completely different. The, the repo is on balance sheet, counts in kind of visibly towards the debt metrics of, of companies. And it's very, very much uh, above uh, the line and the swaps, by contrast, are sort of buried in the in in the footnotes. And so, when we started digging in these in these data, these aggregate data, you get you get these mind blowing numbers, like the outstanding stock of dollar uh, forwards promises to come up with dollars against some other currency that are dated sometime in the in the future. These things are like 90, 90 trillion. So, so we're talking about something very close to world GDP, and the the turnover is something like four trillion a day. So that means some somewhere in the world, uh, somebody has to come up with a, a lot of dollars every every day. And uh, you can say, well, they they they're going to get liquidity going in the other direction, and that's true. But but. Looking at the dollar angle of it, this is these are dollar obligations, and if you don't manage to come up with the dollars, uh, you've you've got a default, you've got a real problem on on your hand, and uh, so you could say that calling it hidden debt is inflammatory. Uh, of course, a central bank organization would use inflammatory language, so that must not be the the case. Um, you you could you could say that worrying about something where there's liquidity coming in the other direction, uh, you know, the accountants say it's cash against cash. So so what is it really? Is it is it really debt? But it it is it is an obligation, and when there's a squeeze uh, on on dollars as there was in 2008, it's it's a real problem. Uh, it's the 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 squeeze is not just that people are uh, taking their maturing dollar deposits and taking them out of BNP Paribas or something. That's that's not the only problem. The the other problem is that the BNP Paribas has lots of dollars that it's got to come up with every day on these maturing uh, swaps. And 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 what we showed in that paper is that the amounts involved are are even larger than the on balance sheet requirements uh, to come up with dollars. And moreover, the swaps are, by their nature, tend to be on quite short term. Uh, lots of them in one day, and even more just mature in a, in a week. So the the churn with that four trillion against the 
daily against a stock of of 90 trillion, the churn is 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 very uh, considerable, and so uh, it it doesn't take much in in the market. Some some flare up in the repo market in in the in the U.S. and and suddenly that reverberates into the deposit markets, but also into these into these uh, forward markets. Now you can say, okay, well, this is $90 trillion. If you want to call it debt, then I just sort of ratchet up my idea of how much debt there is in the world, and I have a new norm, and I go about my business uh, as always. But the, the truth is when a, when a crunch comes, the, this is part of the problem that the Fed is addressing with the swaps. When, when the Fed came in with the swaps in 2008, it had two proximate goals. One of them was to get LIBOR down. To, to, to make sure that the banks stopped posting as high rates because the Fed was lowering the Fed funds rate or being expected to starting in at least our August of 2008. You see the, the three-month OIS uh, going down. And meanwhile, LIBOR is going up. So basically, the Fed's transmission mechanism is kaput at, at that point. They've, they've got to get LIBOR down. And that's feeding right into the floating rate mortgages, uh, the, the, the adjustable rate mortgages, rather, of U.S. Uh, households. It's feeding right into corporate loans all around the world. It, that's an that's interest rate shock that's very real and very proximate. That was an important part of what the Fed was doing. It wasn't just being nice to foreigners. It was trying to get down rates that American companies and households paid. But on top of that, it was also the, the interest rates being paid in these swaps was going up all around the world. And so the, the sort of the blended average of dollar rates in, in the world is not sort of well represented by what the Fed funds rate was trading at. You had LIBOR gapping off of that and you had uh, the uh, swap rates gapping off of, of LIBOR. So you were getting this tremendous tightening in this kind of global currency with the Fed going in the other direction. And so when the, when the Fed comes in with these uh, swaps and gets up to nearly $600 billion, it's trying to fix its transmission. It's trying to lower dollar interest rates all around the world. It, it, it is also, by the way, uh, solving the problem of the foreign banks that were having a hard time coming up with dollars. But that financial stability benefit meeting the run on these banks, uh, that's, that's, that's great, but you should not confuse that with the, the Fed's uh, sole aim in, in this operation. The Fed had real work to do in making sure that its own policy was effective in the rates that matter, the rates that uh, companies, households, and the rest of the world pays. Thank you. So uh, before turning it over to Joseph, so the point about these, whether it's 35 trillion, 90 trillion of swaps that the rest of the world is short those dollars, or I guess in some cases long, the point is it's it's held against other line collateral. So an oil company, ExxonMobil, it could lose you know, a bunch of money being short oil, but it's naturally long oil. So it actually works out. The point is in your paper um, it, it, with, with Claudio Borio was that it's a uh, maturity mismatch of the dollar swap only lasts for a month or three months, whether they're long, um, the assets, the dollar assets that they're long are much longer in maturity, and that can cause uh, instability. And I also write, read, read just from your paces that um, in 2008 and 2020, when the Fed extended those swap lines, they acted on, quote, little information about who owed the debt. So it was not to bail the board. The, the foreign borrowers out and help the rest of the world out. But it wasn't like they were doing, you know, a, a, sounds like a, a extensive uh, credit analysis on you know, who they were giving this, this money to. They were just giving it to the foreign central banks. Joseph, uh, Bob made a lot of points about LIBOR, uh, London uh, Interbank Offering Rate, and how in 2008, yeah, can, can you just ex explain uh, for the audience who's you're not as familiar with the plumbing as you are, what Bob meant by that, as well as the significance <laughs> of how we moved on to, to SOFR. I mean, are we living in a a world where the Federal Reserve has more control over, over, over global money now that we're in a SOFR world rather than LIBOR. Yeah, so so the Fed tries to short, set short-term interest rates, right? So let's say the Fed wants interest rates to be 5% and they expect, uh, you know, if you wanted to borrow, you could borrow around 5%. But sometimes there's actually a gap between where a bank or a company can borrow at and where the Fed would like that to be. 
Uh, so back in 2008, the Fed was setting their interest rates. They wanted interest rates to be low. And yet, despite doing that, LIBOR, which was with the rate that uh, banks were actually borrowing at, what was much higher than what the Fed wanted it to be. So there is a, a big gap between LIBOR and OIS, OIS being a measure of uh, the expectations of Fed policy. So from a Fed, Fed's perspective, or anyone else actually, who's a central bank, uh, that's a policy transmission problem. That's them setting the interest rates to be low, but the market not passing it through. And so that's why they would, they would go in and, and, and do stuff to, uh, to try to get that policy transmission through. Now, Jackie, make a really good point. So today, LIBOR is, is retired. The mm -hmm. Fed and the central banking community more broadly have transitioned to um, new reference rates. In the U.S., that's SOFR. SOFR is, a, is based on repo, so, uh, which is largely, of course, based on where the reverse repo facility is trading. Now, in theory, you can think of that as better policy transmission because the Fed has a lot more control over uh, SOFR than, than uh, let's say, LIBOR. Um, but in practice, though, I mean, you, could, you can do, for example, a SOFR-based swap, but you could still have a basis. Um, so, so it's. Uh, I don't really think it eliminates the the transmission problem. Of course, it's easier to control SOFR than it is to control LIBOR, uh, but that you, you still have a get. You can still have a gap between um, between where SOFR is trading and where the broader market can borrow at. So you still need these other tools. And, and by the way, so Bob's description of uh, the the FX swap hidden data and all that. So that's all you can find that in his papers at the BIS website and. In addition to that, Bob has produced just tremendous, tremendous amounts of knowledge on all aspects of the offshore capital markets and offshore banking. I encourage all of you guys to read through it. it it's certainly been very helpful for me. Um, but more recently, of course, Bob has a new book. Uh, Jack, I guess you can hold it up so <laughs> people can talk about it. Yeah, sorry. I've, I've got all of these uh, papers, which I've read, which I'll read up. But yeah, the book is the eighth edition of uh, Manias, Panics, and Crashes. And yeah, so just one one piece that is a must read is the global domain of the dollar, eight questions. Uh, the piece with uh, Claudio Borio is dollar debt in FX swaps and forwards, huge missing and growing. Uh, I also, uh, uh, London as a financial center since Brexit, ex evidence from the 2022 by BIS triennial survey uh, and, and many others. But, uh, uh, so so Joseph, did you, did you share your opinion? Sorry, I missed that. On does SOFR increase the Federal Reserve uh, control of, of global money? I mean, they can definitely move SOFR a lot easier than, than say, Fed funds because SOFR is much more responsive because the Fed is really active in, in, in uh, the repo market. So they can definitely move SOFR, I think, more easily than they can adjust the federal funds rate. But it doesn't really solve the problem between where the Fed sets its rate and where people ultimately borrow at. Um, if you just look at the FX swap market again, since that's what we were talking about, there, there's still a, a basis. It, it's just that it's measured against SOFR rather than than um, than LIBOR. So um, you still need to have all these other sub supplemental tools, in, in my view, uh, to make sure that policy is transmitted to the end borrower, even though you can toggle your your your, tar your target rate uh, easier. So Joseph, a question for you, if I may turn the yeah. uh, tables. Um, do you think the Fed will be less worried about the dollar interest rates that the rest of the world is paying if it can control SOFR and it's managed to get U.S. Uh, adjustable rate uh, mortgages and U.S. floating rate corporate loans onto, onto SOFR? So is, has it sort of domesticated the setting of interest rates, the short-term interest rate in the dollar, the benchmark interest rate in dollar enough so that it can be less concerned? Because you could say it was just kind of a happy accident that the Fed had to be worried about LIBOR because it, it was so much used in the United States, even though it was determined in, in London. And that happy accident is now over. And so does the Fed become less cosmopolitan in its view of the dollar markets, more willing to let the rest of the world fend with fend, fend off uh, higher U.S. interest rates, whether they show up as spreads over 
SOFR or as uh, uh, deviations from interest parity in, in the forward markets. You know, that, that, that's actually a really good point. Uh, let's say, for example, today you have a, a loan that's LIBOR, uh, SOFR plus a spread. Uh, so, so far, the Fed has really good control over. So that's going to be what the Fed wants want, wants it to be. Uh, in contrast, back when we were, let's say, LIBOR plus the spread, you could you could have situations where the divergence between LIBOR and Fed funds widened significantly. So you could have people uh, receiving or paying rates that that are very different from what the Fed wanted it to be. So, I think I think another aspect about policy transmission. Uh, is that you're going to, when we go into these discontinuities, these risk off events, one big difference going forward is that, so if you are in a stressful situation, you would expect LIBOR, which people used to refer to, to, to widen as a, against the Fed's benchmark. So there's more credit risk. Right. But in contrast, for SOFR though, you'd expect the opposite, right? So I think that, that that's going to be difficult for the market to, to digest because in a sense, when you have big risk-off events, you're not getting properly compensated as you would if you were referencing LIBOR. In fact, you're, you're going to you'll be receiving less, especially since I think your spread to SOFR is going to be fixed. So I think that's that's going to be difficult to digest. But to, to the point we were talking about, does the Fed have to care less? I think that it's not so much about SOFR as to the spread that you would have to borrow receive over silver so far so that part is going to be fixed and it's not going to be dynamically adjustable because LIBOR adjusts itself to, to credit risk and things like that but so far doesn't so in a sense that, that can make policy transmission more difficult because the price is rigid and, and it doesn't doesn't actually um, incorporate all the information that's happening in markets the same way that a credit sensitive rate would, would be. Uh, I think that doesn't make the Fed's job easier because, you know, ultimately it's not just about, you know, hitting that target, but mm -hmm. does, does the interest rate actually represent something that, that uh, is in the markets? And if not, you could actually see rather than it being expressed in price, so LIBOR widens, you can, um, in, rather than being expressed in rates, so LIBOR Widening to to Fed benchmark, maybe it's expressed in price, so that the, the price of the debt uh, decreases more to, to compensate compensate the lender. So it'll just manifest in different ways, perhaps. And yeah, I think of the case of the Irish banks that had lent uh, to, for home mortgages based on the ECB's policy rate, and uh, that seemed clever at the time. It was floating and 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 so on, but then it turned out that uh, the, the Irish banks got into difficulties and, and, and they all, all had to pay up in relation to the whole structure of, of rates. And so suddenly they were paying more than they were getting on the mortgages. And so if you have a similar sort of situation where the, the, the credit risk, what used to show up as the TED spread, the treasury euro dollar spread, begins to just be kind of happening to bank costs, whether they're in the commercial paper market or in the CD market or, or wherever, but it, it's sort of showing up there, but doesn't find its way into the benchmark at all. Then, the, the, and as you say, the SOFR spread isn't dynamic, then you could get things kind of going upside down for the banks, particularly perhaps the foreign banks. And so how they respond to that, they've 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 sort of lost that protective credit wrap of LIBOR, if you will, and and now they're they're upside down and paying more than they're getting on some corporate loans or, or some CLOs or or something, and uh, do they just have to dump? And and so your your point is, uh, does it show up in the price of the loans? I guess I tweak that and ask, does it show up? in kind of a fire sale scenario where, okay, you know, you guys have set this up so that, you know, when the uh, yogurt is hitting the fan, uh, I'm running a negative spread on this, on this book in the U S and you can have it back. Uh, and I'll pay you to take it back. You can have it back at 
96 or something. And so maybe the, the Fed can be no more neglectful of that possibility than it was able to ignore the spread between euro dollars and, and the Fed, Fed funds. And so it continues to act in this kind of global cosmopolitan fashion. But you, I, I guess I do, I do worry that without the thing, the problem sort of staring you in the face in the form of, of, of LIBOR, that somehow it's easier to lose track of what matters, what actually is getting paid by people in the private sector, as opposed to what you're targeting. If, if I go back to 2008, the October FOMC, and I count the number of times the Fed funds rate is mentioned, how many times LIBOR is mentioned, <laughs> there's a, considering that they had gone in, in, in the opposite direction in the, uh, in the intermediate period, uh, you, you'd be surprised how predominant the discussion of Fed funds was. So as a sort of displacement from the ultimate end to a means which is usually sort of well and understandably related to the to the end, you know. And then when they diverge, can you can you can you react to the right one? And can you react to the right one in a timely fashion to the extent necessary? That's that's the question. I I'm, I have I have no reason to believe they're not up to it, but it it it. It is a it's an adjustment to be made, it seems to me. And uh, hitting your target uh, isn't isn't necessarily going to make the monetary policy work. So, so if I understand right, LIBOR had a credit element. So LIBOR spreads would widen during periods of stress. And if it was so for um, secured overnight financing rate, then it wouldn't widen. And if you were a bank that was long a loan to a real estate developer, 7% plus SOFR, you actually, what you're earning would not go up. Uh, no, so, so, for, so for plus two and a half, let's, let's. So, so for plus two and a half. Yeah, yeah. This, so, this so, is not Argentina. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mark Zuckerberg got a mortgage for, for 1%. Uh, so um, so uh, then it wouldn't spread out. So your cost of funds would increase, but your loan yields would not. Thank you both for being so generous. This is the longest interview I've ever done. But Joseph, can you ask one <laughs> final question for, for Bob? So Bob, you know, when people listen to this re interview, they're going to be amazed. So if people want to follow your work and they want to hear more about what, what you're working on, where can they find you? Well, what I'm working on right now, thanks for the opportunity, is a book called The Domain of the Dollar. And uh, this kind of discussion is immensely helpful. Your questions are great guidance. So it won't be in your bookstores this year, but uh, look, look for it uh, next year from Cambridge University uh, Press. You uh, Critics will say it's just a Macaulay best hit album. Uh, <laughs> has, has all the vices of that sort of effort. Um, old and in the way, old and out of the way, but uh, that that's that, that'll be one place, and um, uh, otherwise, um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty easily searchable, I think. Yep, and yeah. we'll put a link to all of your most recent uh, pieces in the description, uh, as well as a link to uh, the eighth edition of Mania's Panics and Crashes. Bob, thank you so much for being generous with your time and insights. Joseph, thank you as well. Of course, people can find you on Twitter at FedGuy12, uh, FedGuy.com, and your book, of course, Central Banking 101. Gentlemen, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for watching. Great. Thanks so much. See you. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.